Wow, that was great. Give it up for the worship team, y'all, right? How is everybody doing this morning? Yeah, wide awake? Yeah, good. Coffee, yeah, that helps. I love coffee too, probably too much. Here, I'll take it. Uh, my wife said I should stop using stuffed animals for props because people aren't going to take me seriously. So I got two of them for today. So, um, sorry. But how many of you guys were here last week? Just kind of show a hands real quick. I just kind of want to see. I'm counting. Okay, cool. Um, really, I just want to kind of know who I'm talking to if, if, we, if I need to do a ton of catch up. But um, last week, we kind of opened up with a series uh, talking about if you can remember, it was uh, how if you've ever been to church and you were told uh, about your sin and kind of what you're supposed to do about your sin, and then usually you go home <laughs> and then unfortunately you fall into that sin, then you go, then you ask for forgiveness and then you go back to church and then you were told about sin and there's kind of a cycle. Do you guys remember some of that talk last week? Um, so we not only talked about that, but we also talked about a little bit of the spin and what we're to do uh, viewing some of these things through the eyes of grace. And so that's what we're going to continue on this week. I actually have a template. I think it's, do we still have it, Mary? There we go. Okay, so it's a template and it kind of has all of the sins that were um, told. This is, this is one denomination. There's so many denominations uh, that talk about uh, the seven deadly sins. And so, and it gives you um, the, the way to overcome them. And that's kind of what we've been going through is how to overcome these sins, okay? Um, and if you remember, so far we've covered lust, gluttony, and pride. And so today we're going to pick back up with the fourth deadly sin, which is the sloth, okay? So, um, yeah, first of all, I want to ask, why would they pick a sloth, right? Like, is he not cute? Her? It's the mother and the, the baby, yep. Um, but is, you know, like, first of all, they tell us to, to, the way to overcome the sin of sloth is to be diligent. No big deal, just be diligent. Uh, to make a schedule, right? Kind of have things prioritized. And then to not plan around resting. Don't rest at all. We're not supposed to rest. We're supposed to have our list and check it twice. Um, but those that were here last week, how many of you remember, it was funny because for lust and for gluttony, they told us to exercise, right? And then for some reason for sloth, they forgot to mention that. I'm like, I would think that to overcome the slothdom, you would exercise, but no, not so much. Uh, the word slothful actually suggests a love of ease and a dislike of movement or activity. Another word for it could be lazy, right? And some of the wives are kind of elbowing their husbands, thinking we're going to talk about laziness tonight. Bad news, we're not going to. Um, most would say in order to avoid laziness, you need to be diligent. Would we agree? In order to avoid laziness, you need to be diligent. Um, unfortunately, 92% of Americans, probably not us, because maybe we didn't do the, uh, the New Year's resolutions, but 92% of Americans um, did not fulfill their New Year's resolutions. Can we kind of agree with some of that? That means only 8% actually fulfill their New Year's resolution. Um, their answer, or the church's answer, is because they are lazy. You've fallen in, into the sin of slothfulness. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get right into the spin on this. Number four spin to overcoming sin, and specifically the sin of slothfulness, is sonship. Um, Clark did a series, you guys were here maybe a month ago, about sons, not servants. I would recommend, if you have time, go back and check that message out. It was phenomenal. Um, and I'm not really sure why um, people want to still be called servants. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, I, I, other than the fact that maybe there's like a, hum, a humility that comes with feeling like you're a servant. Um, Scripture says in 1 John 3, 1, it says, what marvelous love, it's not, I don't have a reference, so just, it says, what marvelous love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters or children of God, right? And so when we get a hold of that fact, if like you can get a hold of the fact that you are a son or a daughter of God, 
I can promise you, you're going to do way more for God than you would as a servant. A servant kind of does whatever they're told. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a family business, <laughs> but family businesses, usually they, when they hire their children, they go way beyond what the employees do. And that's why they're elevated in the, in the companies because they just go way beyond because they're about the family business. I love uh, 1 Corinthians 15.10. It says, but God's amazing grace. Now, you might say, Matt, you guys talk way too much about grace. I'm sorry, Paul did it first. But God's amazing grace has made me who I am. And his grace to me was not fruitless. In fact, I worked harder than all the rest. Yet not in my own strength, but God's. For his empowering grace is poured out upon me. So Paul said it's by God's amazing grace that we are who we are. He said, I am who I am by the grace of God. And we are sons and daughters of God by his amazing grace. Why did Paul work harder? Because of the grace of God. I present today, okay, maybe you've heard this before, but I present today that law produces apathy. Law equals apathy, okay? Grace produces activation. It actually produces an activation in your life. You know how many churches, and maybe you guys have been, been through this process too, I've been to churches where the spouses are dragging their spouses to church, okay? Um, and these are law-based churches. Now, I will say, if you're dragging your spouse to this church, just keep on doing it. It's fine. I don't disagree with it, <laughs> all right? But I've been to a lot of churches where they're dragging their spouse to church. And I've even seen where people in ministry are dragging their spouses to church. I knew a, a, a lady pastor up north where she was begging her husband to come for years and he didn't want to come. And I actually think it was just because he was a little more honest than she was. Like she just, he, he thought, well, that's just too hard to live that life. So I'm just going to stay back. He supported her in what she did, but he just chose, I'm not going to go to that church. I can't, I can't do what they're asking me. Um, some people say grace promotes laziness. Has you, have you guys ever heard that? It kind of promotes laziness, like there's a laziness about. But, well, I kind of want to clear some things up, okay, just all around. Um, I've seen people take the word rest, right, and kind of translate it into I don't need to do anything in life. Has anybody ever seen that? It's like, well, I'm just resting right now, right? And I really want to say, like, you, you never saw the disciples. They didn't do that, did they? They seemed a little busy, I, th I think. Um, Paul, he was making tents. He wasn't making hammocks. Did you guys notice that, too? <laughs> right? He built tents. He was pretty busy. Um, but I've seen good, meaning people get a hold of this grace message and then just kind of move into this resting mode, right? I've seen people even quit their jobs and stay home and not do anything for their wife, not be involved in the church because they're resting, right? I've actually seen this. Um, and yes, you don't have to do anything. I'm going to say it because we don't preach law here, right? You don't have to do anything else for God. You, I, right now, like if you were to go and be with God in heaven right now, which pray none of you do, but uh, if you did, you don't have to do anything. Like God is pleased with you right where you're at. Um, but if you try to pull that card, and maybe you guys can agree with this, but if you try to pull that card with your wife or with your job, there are consequences to resting. <laughs> right? Uh, honey, I can't wash the dishes today because I'm resting. I can't take the trash out. God, you know, I, I, I'm trying to rest, honey. Can you take the trash out today? Um, or if you were to try and tell your job that, I, I, you know, I... Boss, I'm not called to works, right? <laughs> they, there will be a little bit of a consequence for that. And I can promise you, if it were to happen to me and I was driving home and I said, hey, honey, uh, I told my boss I'm not called to works and they said, you can just stay home. And my, my wife would probably say, you need to pick yourself up some works toilet bowl cleaner <laughs> and help me get into works here at the house, Okay. <laughs> So it doesn't really translate into everyday life. And if you feel like this, you're probably not getting the same grace that we're talking about. Grace is not a bubble bath. It's actually a diving board. 
it's meant to launch and to motivate. Um, if you, if you, I read this the other day on escapetoreality.com. Paul Ellis, he wrote, um, it was actually about John Bunyan, and he expresses it perfectly. This is a rhyme that he wrote. It says, run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings, it bids us to fly and gives us wings. I want you to know I'm way more active and involved and accomplished in ministry now only because I'm not doing it from a place of I have to. I'm doing it from a place of I want to. I actually get the opportunity to. Right? You remember the scripture, uh, it says, uh, it talks about uh, where Jesus was being baptized and the heavens opened up. And it says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? And I've heard people and good pastors say from the pulpit that, uh, man, I hope one day that that's going to be me. I really hope that when I get to heaven, God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But if I can tell you something, that was actually at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He hadn't done anything at all at that point. Right? And then you know the scripture that says, as he is, so are we in this world. Right? If we are just like him in this world, and God was pleased with Jesus before he had done anything at all, I want you to know right where you're at, whatever you're doing, he's pleased with you, and you don't have to do one more thing for God. Amen? Um, the fifth deadly sin is wrath. Everybody say wrath. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, maybe anger. I don't know. Um, it says to be patient, uh, to be moderate, and deep breath. <sighs> right? That's the way you overcome wrath. Uh, be patient, or patience is a virtue. Have you ever been angry about something and then somebody says patience is a virtue? <laughs> like, no, it's not. Maybe it is, but I don't have it right now. Um, how many of you lack patience? Anybody in here lack patience? Now, I was hoping for a better show of hands on that one. Like, because if we're like, okay, let me say it this way. How many of you have gotten behind the wheel and your patience just went out the door? Anybody been like that? We got some more honesty in here. Uh, my wife is probably one of the nicest people I know. You get her behind the wheel and she turns into like a 300 pound angry redneck person that thinks they're driving an F-350 lifted, right? You really do. And I'm thinking, if you keep honking your horn, I'm the one that has to protect you from this. <laughs> so, right? Please dial it back. I used to read patient scriptures when her and I were first married. I used to read patient scriptures, like as if that was going to help. And I remember it was usually when we were on our way to church. And for some reason, when you're on your way to church, the wife needs to take extra time to get ready. But I remember she would be getting ready, and I'd be reading more patient scripture, scriptures, and I would just be getting more angry because all I'm doing is realizing I'm only reading more scriptures. I would run out of patient scriptures, which I don't know if that's possible, but it seems like the more I would read, the more angry I would get. The fifth spin to overcoming sin, and specifically the sin of wrath, is to receive his love. Now, some of you might say, well, I already received his love uh, when I first came to the Lord. I want you to know it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing this thing. I want you to know forever you can continually be receiving his love. Amen. Right? You, you guys know the scripture in Revelation where they said that, um, you know, you need to go back to your first love. Right? And I used to think, man, I need to go back to my first love. Like, but really, what's so funny, if, we, if you really think about when you first came to know the Lord, it wasn't so much about your love for him. It was more of a revelation of his love for you. And you just loved him all the more because you were finding out, oh my gosh, he loves me in spite of this and in spite of that. And so when we go back to our first love, it's not so much, hey, let me try and conjure up being in love with God again. It's really just looking back and saying, man, God loves me this much. Um, Clark, you guys have heard Clark say that we need to be good receivers. Anybody heard that in here? Um, I struggle with that about a lot of things. Um, I remember, you know, I like helping people get places and move, and I, I like helping, you know, if somebody's car breaks down, I love to go and bail them out. Please don't call. Uh, I'm just kidding. No, uh, <laughs> I really do. Um, but I remember years ago, uh, my, I, I, was, I was moving, 
and I remember just kind of being stressed out. I went into the gas station, and I think I, I forgot to, I, I paid, I don't know if you've ever done this, I paid, and then just left, okay? I didn't even fill up my tank. And so I was driving, <laughs> and all of a sudden my truck starts to like, and I thought it was dying, I thought just something happened, because I'm like, I just put gas in. So I call my buddy, and I'm like, hey man, I don't know, and I, I had a gas, uh, my gas gauge was broken. I said, hey, I said, I need some help. Um, I think my car broke down, and he goes, well, did you put gas in it? I said, yeah, I broke it, I, you know, I, I put gas in it this morning, and he's like, well, can I bring you some gas just in case? I'm like, no, please don't, don't bring gas, just come pick me up, I'll figure it out on my own. No, let me come and bring, and he, I remember he kind of kept arguing, arguing, then he just shows up with this gas can full of gas, and then just got out, starts filling up my, my truck, and then just smiling at me while he's doing it, right? <laughs> And I smiled back at him, and I thought, this, you know, and he goes, why don't you go start your car? I start it, and it starts right up, okay? I had run out of gas, but I had such a hard time receiving that, that I, I was going to be stuck there for a lot longer. And I feel like that's kind of how this whole, like, love thing is. Sometimes we're, we're trying to love people on an empty tank, okay? And you need to recognize, man, you got to sometimes let God fill you back up. Even though I know the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, sometimes it's a renewal of our mind and helping us just to receive. God, help me to love others. And it all ties in with him loving us. First John 4, 7 through 11, it says, those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour from you to one another because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. The one who does, doesn't love has yet to know God for God is is love. The light of God, God's love, shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. Delightfully loved ones, if he loved us with such a tremendous love, then loving one another should be our way of life. Like that should actually come really easy to us because we're, it's more about understanding his love for us. The sixth deadly sin is greed. Uh, the answer to, to greed is, or their answer to greed is to be generous and to donate to the poor. Be generous. And I actually don't think that's a bad method. Like, if you just want to be generous, I don't think that that, like, if you struggle with those things, I don't think it's a bad, I, I think it's just, you got to be careful about getting into a works situation altogether with, with being generous, right? I've seen people actually get into a work situation. Um, you know, kind of things I've heard over the years, ideas I've heard is give to get, right? Or you got to give to be able to receive, Right? And I have a question, it's kind of just a challenging question, rhetorical, just think about it. But do you actually think that God needs your money? Probably not going to hear this from any pulpit very often, right? But do you actually think that God needs your money? Do you think that God needs your time? I remember that was such a revelation for me and my wife when we realized, like, man, God doesn't really need anything from me, right? Do you think that he's disappointed when you don't give those things? Do you think that, right? Right? God's favor isn't something that can be earned or purchased. Or maybe you've heard this. Uh, I remember hearing this at Bible school when I was so discouraged as a broke Bible school student. Um, but give otherwise dot, dot, dot. Anybody ever heard that? Uh, you know, he's going to close the windows of heaven or, you know, bust out Malachi 3 and then they read it to you and you're like, oh, man. All of these things happen. I remember when I was at Bible school, I was like, I don't have any money to give, okay? Okay. Um, but see the cross, or see through the cross, God has already opened the floodgates of heaven, right? They couldn't be any more open than they already are, all right? But they are not, they are not open because you gave. They are not open because you had enough faith. They are open because Jesus opened them with the death, burial, and resurrection, According to th Ephesians 3.20, y'all probably know it, it, it says that God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think, okay? Can I tell you that your giving is not going to hold up God's generosity with you? He wants to convince you of his love. He wants to show you how much he loves you. In fact, all the, sometimes all God asks from us is to ask, right? He like, he just wants to ask. And then I love the verse that says that he even knows what things we have need of even before we ask. The sixth 
spin to overcoming sin, and specifically the sin of greed, is to be convinced. Be convinced. Philippians 4.19, it says, I am convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need you have, for I have seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through Jesus Christ. That word convinced in the Greek, it's pytho, which means to persuade to have confidence. To persuade or to have confidence. In passive tense, right, it means be persuaded of what is trustworthy. Some of you need to be persuaded that God is trustworthy. And the person that you allow to persuade you is God himself. It's not me. It's not somebody else. It's really you need to allow yourself to be persuaded of who he is and allow God to do the persuasion. Um, If there really is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, then generosity is completely up to us, right? If there's no condemnation, then when we want to be generous, it's all up to us. Doesn't that make generosity fun, right? If you ever feel like you have to give, don't. If you ever feel like you have to give to something or someone, don't. Don't ever give to people or things because you have to. Give because you're excited about it. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, I watched, uh, you know, we had a garage sale, and my little sister was selling lemonade. You guys have seen the lemonade stands, right? And uh, my little sister was selling, and nobody gave her anything all day long, okay? Right? And it broke my heart. And it's real funny because... um, uh, I used to have this uh, worker that when we mowed grass, he'd help me mow grass. And every time I saw a lemonade stand, okay, I would see these little kids out there, and sometimes it was at 3 or 5 o'clock. I would pass them on accident, and then I'd realize, oh, my, oh I want to go back. And I would put it in reverse with this huge trailer and all these mowers, and I'm backing up trying to get back to this thing, you know. And then I'd run up, and I'd give this money, and it was way more for the grossest lemonade you've ever had in your life. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, and you sip it down, you're like, oh, that's so good in front of the kids, you know? And they, then you give them 10 or 20 bucks, and then they run in and go tell their parents, and their parents are like, how in the world did you make $20 in five minutes, you know? But I want you to know, I didn't do that because I had to. I did it because I want to. And that's how God is with us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. It didn't say for God so loved the world that he had to give, He didn't say, for God so loved the world that he felt obligated to give. He gave because he loved. Amen? Amen. Um, The seventh deadly sin, and it's actually the the final sin, um, is to thank God every day. That's what they say. In order to overcome envy, we have to thank God every day. Uh, Comparison is what kills contentment. Comparison is is what kills contentment. I I read this the other day. Comparison is the toxicity towards contentment. Comparison is, I mean, how many of you guys, Instagram is a place where this stuff is all over the place, right? You get on Instagram or you get on Facebook and you see people that look like models in these pictures, right? I don't know if you've ever been to the beach. I've been to the beach with my family and you'll have people that have been on their phones the whole time. Then they go down and they have this like splashing down by the water, okay? You guys ever seen it? And my little girls look at me and they're like, what are they doing? And I, I look at my girls, I'm like, they have no idea what they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're seeing this. But, or trips. Anybody ever seen people going on trips? And it's like, oh, look, they're going on another trip. Cool. I'm so excited for them to go on one more trip to wherever they're going. Right? But really, it's the picture of the good life. Right? And there is a constant nagging that when you don't have the new shiny thing, then you're behind. But really, we're just trying to keep up with an illusion. Right? Trying to keep up with the Joneses. And the Joneses are broke. Okay? They're probably in debt having these trips and all the other things that they're doing. Okay? But they're making it, making it happen. And the seventh spin to overcoming sin is and specifically the sin of envy, is to draw from the source. It's to draw from the source. And I want to read to you a quick story. Um, I was going to paraphrase it, but I was afraid I'm going to, like, skip over some things. So I might just read it to you. We start off in the NIV, and then we switch over to the Passion, and I'll explain to you why we switch over. But NIV kind of has a couple things, and I switch over. But 
verse 7, it starts off, well, let me, let me just kind of lay it out for you, but this story, um, it was really cool because Chris actually, he, him and I have not talked about the service or the message or anything, and one of his things that he was praying for last week is he talked about the Samaritan woman. Do you guys remember that? It was really good, and I actually got to hear it uh, just a couple days ago. I listened to the, the service, and I was like, oh, cool. I didn't realize he did that. I was outside. But... Um, this really sums up, if we were going to talk about all, the, all sin, like seven, the seven deadly sins, much less all sin, but this story really sums up uh, this whole sin issue, okay? And it, it's Jesus, and it, I love that he pointed out, it said that Jesus felt that he had to go through Samaria. Now, historians can say, like, you, you, you don't necessarily have to go through this town, but it said that he had to. He felt that he had to. And really, most Jews would avoid this town. And the reason why, if you know anything about the Samaritans, uh, there was a, some Samaritans, that I think it was roughly 700 B.C., that they were captured by this Assyrian Empire. We've talked about this before, right? And they were captured, and then um, uh, the Syrians had children with these Jews, and that's where the Samaritan um, people came from, Okay. Um, so, and the Jews were mad about that because it, it ruined uh, what they had protected so sacred to them, to their hearts, which was their, their lineage, which was uh, their bloodline. They were trying to keep that protected, and these Assyrians took that from them. And so that's why the Jews didn't even want to talk to these Samaritan people, okay? And here Jesus, it said that he had to go to Samaria and talk to this lady. In verse 7, it says, the Samaritan woman came to the well to get some water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Jesus asked this, and it says, this happened while his followers were in town buying some food. The woman answered, I am surprised that you asked me for a drink. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus answered, you don't know what God can give you, and you don't know who I am. The one who asked you for a drink, if you knew um, you would have asked me, and I would give you living water. Verse 11, it says, The woman said, Sir, where will you get that living water? The well is very deep, and you have nothing to get uh, the water with. Are you greater than your ancestor Jacob? He is the one who gave us this well. He drank from it himself, and his sons and all his animals drank from it too. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But anyone who drinks the water... I give will never be thirsty again. The water I give people will be like a spring flow, spring flowing inside of them. I want you to get a picture of that. That's why I stuck with this translation, a spring flowing inside of them. It will bring them eternal life. The woman said to Jesus, sir, give me this water, then I will never be thirsty again. I won't have to come back here to get any more water. Jesus told her, go get your husband and come back. The woman answered, but I have no husband, Jesus said to her, you have said this, or you, uh, you are right to say you have no husband. That's because although you, you have had five husbands and many will live with, uh, or the man you live with now is not your husband. Let's skip down to uh, verse 25 in the Passion Translation. I just want to skip through some of that. Um, he kind of explains in, this, in that little section that I'm skipping, but he explains that there's going to be one day that anybody and everybody can go worship God, right? It says that in spirit and in truth, that anybody and everybody. And, and it's funny that she knew that there was going to be an anointed person coming because she really wasn't even, it wasn't necessary that she knew. It was mostly about the Jews. But she knew that this person was coming. In verse 25 uh, we pick up, it says, the woman said, this is all so confusing, but I do not, I do know that the anointed one is coming, the true Messiah, and when he comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. Jesus said to her, you don't have to wait any longer. The anointed one is here speaking with you. I am the one you're looking for. At that moment, his disciples returned and were stunned to see Jesus speaking with the Samaritan woman, yet none of them asked why or what they were discussing. I love that part because it's like, you know that they wanted to ask, but they were terrified because really he wasn't even supposed to be, they were probably not even supposed to be in that town, okay? And he's, and he's talking with her and all at once the woman left her water jar and ran off to her village and told everyone. So here she leaves the water jar, okay? She leaves this jar 
just left it and went and told everybody um, that she had just talked to Jesus. It says, come and meet a man at the well who told me everything I've ever done. He could be the one we've been waiting for hearing this. The people came streaming out of the village to go see Jesus. Then the disciples began to insist that Jesus eat some food they brought back with them saying, teacher, you must eat something. But Jesus told them, I have eaten a meal you don't know about. Puzzled by this, the disciples began to discuss it among themselves. Did someone already bring him food? To clarify, Jesus spoke up and said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to bring it to completion. I know that was a lot, but I I felt like I had to read it. Um, And the question that I just have is, why didn't Jesus need food? Why didn't he need anything to eat? And I I really think it ties in with verse 28. It says, all at once, the woman left her water jar and ran off to her village and told everyone, come and meet a man at the well who told me everything I've ever done. And and he could be the one we've been waiting for. I love it because it says, he told me everything I've ever done. And it doesn't say this, right? It doesn't say this part, but I can imagine that wasn't that big of a deal. But the fact that he kept talking to her She probably said, he told me everything I ever done, and he kept talking to me. He kept being there with me, right? The only thing that causes us to leave our jar, I had a picture of this. I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is doctrinally accurate. I don't know. You guys can check me if you want, but this jar, I think, just represents us trying to overcome our sin, okay? And really, if you think about it, I, I want to give you permission. If you feel like it's your job to overcome your sin, go for it. I give you free access to do that. I'm not going to stop you. But what I picture is somebody, that's what, that's what this person, that's what this jar represents, is you can only get so much water out of a well with this, right? You can only focus on one sin at a time, okay? And it says that I want to give you water that springs forth, and if you, can you picture somebody trying to take, like, a, trying to get a spring, you know, like, it's just going to be crazy, it's going to be chaos, and you're not going to be able to get all the water because it's overflowing, right? And with a well, especially a man-made well, you're going to only be able to pull up so much. You're going to only be able to overcome so much singularly than you would be plurally when it's not really your job. In fact, you're supposed to leave your jar at the well. You're supposed to leave your capability of overcoming your sin the moment you're sitting with Jesus. Because really, he's trying to point out, you won't ever have to drink again if you would just stop drawing from this well and draw from the well that I give you. Maybe the food that fills God is for people to stop trying to drink water that never quenches our thirst. When you drink living water, you will run from the things that you've tried to fill your whole life with in times past. I'm going to close with this last verse, Romans 6, 11. It says, so let it be the same way with you. Since you are now joined with him, you must continually view yourself as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the anointed one. The only thing that is deadly about any sin is for you to not realize that you are dead to sin. That's the only thing. You never had the capacity to overcome sin, and that's why uh, the sin of the world had to be nailed to the cross. The world thinks, this is, this is kind of interesting to me, the world thinks that sin will fulfill them. I remember there was a day where I thought, before I knew Jesus, man, that one sin will fulfill me. Then the church has been taught, if you overcome your sin, then you'll be fulfilled, right? Right? But the spin of spins is that the only thing that will fill you is the one who fulfilled it all. Slothful people will find energy when they draw from the source that is not their own. Generous people give because they've been convinced that God is generous with them. Righteous people do right things because they know no matter what, they are right with him. And love people love only because... They know they don't have to. They get to because it's overflowing like a spring. We don't have to try and overcome our sin. He's already done it for us. Amen? That's the good news. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you guys. Father, we thank you, God. You can lift your hands with me. God, we 
We thank you, God, for who you are. We trust you, God. We thank you, God. We've tried to draw from the well, God. We've tried to overcome our own sin. But the true overcoming only comes when we realize that you've already done it. You've already paid the price. You've already lived the life that we couldn't live, God. And so we look to you. We ask you, God, that you help us to walk with you, to talk with you, to sit and listen to hear, hear what you have to say. We love you, God. We worship you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Amen.